Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody here today. It's going to be a scorcher this coming week, so uh, remember to stay hydrated and uh, don't get uh, too hot out there. Uh, we don't have a whole lot in terms of changes from our normal church schedule. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, people might be interested in is that if you have any needs for uh, shop with script cards, uh, please get those orders in sooner rather than later uh, because from what I understand there may be a, a strike that is impending so uh, you want to uh, get moving on that stuff as soon as possible if you want to get the uh, script cards uh, shipped to us in the uh, uh, reasonable amount of time. So. Uh, you know, just, just the idea that if, you, if you've been thinking about any of these Shop of Script gift cards, uh, now would be the time to uh, go about doing that. Well, the, uh, today's uh, sermon uh, title is How Does God Sort Us Out? We have the wheat and the tares today, as they say in the old King James, uh, the parable of the weeds. And uh, so the, the theme is how uh, God deals with us in this world that is an admixture of good and evil. And although uh, a lot of times people will look at you know, the problem of evil when we deal with this topic, I'm going with a, a more historical-based theme today in the sense of uh, how do we approach the world and the fact that it is an admixture of good and evil in, in a way that's consistent with how our Lord approaches us as opposed to how have Christians uh, taken bad approaches in the past and what can we learn about not doing that again. So that's, that's the kind of approach we're going to have today. So we'll be focusing upon God's kingdom, grace, and mercy uh, towards us today. And uh, in light of that, we'll begin with the opening hymn, I Love Your Kingdom, Lord. Who made heaven and earth, 
If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His only begotten Son to die for each and every one of you, and for His sake, He forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of that same Christ, and by His authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seek my life, and they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. O 
God, so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit that, ever mindful of your final judgment, we may be stirred up to holiness of living here and dwell with you in perfect joy hereafter. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 44. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The epistle is from Romans chapter 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay, and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Please rise as we sing together the Alleluia and verse. <clears throat> Did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. 
So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat also with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. Then he let the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, the field is the world, and the good seed is the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Together we confess the Christian faith using the Nicene Creed on page 206. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and all things that is Lord and invisible. And one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for our sin and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made a man. And was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoke by the gods. And I believe in one of the Holy Christian and the Catholic Church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look at the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Sermon title is, How Does God Sort Us Out? People argue about things from religion and politics to sports teams and soft drinks. From the 1960s through at least the 1980s, the Cola Wars left their mark on American TV. Coca-Cola placed itself as authentic, trustworthy, and unbeatable. Pepsi placed itself as young, dynamic, and positive. Dr. Pepper challenged us to be a pepper, too. This product placement emerged in film and TV. Don DeLuise sang the Dr. Pepper jingle in the star-studded film Cannonball Run. Penny Marshall drank milk and Pepsi on the hit show Laverne and Shirley. Either Penny or the writers may have based the idea on the egg cream, which some recipes make with half and half chocolate syrup and club soda. Since ice cream uses both eggs and cream, Jewish people in New York who kept kosher needed an alternative to an ice cream soda. In case you haven't figured it out, an egg cream has no egg. Uh, in 1982, there also was an episode of Laverne and Shirley where milk and coke appeared as an unpleasant rival. 
in the past few years, these milk and soda drinks have become an internet phenomenon, a kind of a, a meme on Instagram and TikTok. Things got even more interesting because they got theological. In season one, Laverne reads a note that says, if in heaven we don't meet, hand in hand we'll bear the heat, and if it ever gets too hot, Pepsi-Cola hits the spot. Coke and Pepsi are similar products. They are used in similar situations, and they pair with similar foods. Yet, they taste somewhat different, and they have different makers. This is enough to spark a rivalry that is legendary in American popular culture. Christianity and Gnosticism get along about as well as Coke and Pepsi. The word Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which is related to our word to know, to have knowledge. Christianity sees Old Testament themes and prophecies fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The result is God's eternal kingdom that emerges now in a gracious manner. Eternal life begins by receiving faith, baptism, the Lord's Supper, and Christian instruction. Gnosticism also has a message of overcoming this mortal life. Taking cues from Plato, the Greek mind-body split, as well as Zoroastrianism and Hinduism, Gnosticism tends to see a kind of dualism, such as good versus evil, inner world versus outer world, and spirit versus matter. The first two epistles of John speak against the idea that Jesus could not be human because material things are evil. In Ephesus, a man called Kerintus taught that the mere man, Jesus, was adopted by a divine spirit until he was crucified. John engages these ideas in 1 John 1 verse 1, 4 verse 2, and 5 verse 6. We see the first chapter of John's Gospel also reject Gnosticism. Yet Gnostic ideas continued. In the second and third centuries, the Gospels of Thomas and Judas were written. The Gnostic Marcionite Church lasted from the second to the fifth centuries. The Paulicians arose in the seventh century until converting to Catholicism around 1650. Then the Bogomils emerged in the first Bulgarian Empire in the 10th century and became targets of crusades in the Balkans between the 13th and 15th centuries. They may have influenced the rise of the Cathars in the 11th century. And we will look at the Cathars in light of our gospel text. The Cathars appeared in southern France and northern Italy. They believed in two gods. The good god was that of the New Testament, who created the spiritual realm. The evil god was that of the Old Testament, who created the physical realm. Pope Innocent III first took a peaceful approach, but then the papal legate was murdered in 1208. A 20-year crusade against the Cathars began in 1209. Now, military-based crusader movements lasted between 1096, the start of the First Crusade, and 1492, the end of the Reconquista in Spain. Religious wars also continued uh, between 1546 and 1648. The papacy emerged from the suppression of the Byzantine Empire, Roman aristocracy, and the Holy Roman Empire becoming a rich political power. Europeans wanted to strike back at Islamic Jihad with a holy war of their own. The theater of war stretched from the military conversion of Scandinavia and Baltic lands in the north to defending against Mongols in the east to seizing Mediterranean territory from both Muslim and Christian alike. 
Yet this frenetic activity saw Christians also stooping to new lows. On the theological front, Pope John the 22nd dissolved or, or suppressed the uh, Franciscan spirituals because they dared to question how a papacy that had become a rich political and military power could be Christian in the same way as Jesus. Thus the meme of Pope as Antichrist was born. Another low point was the massacre at Béziers. The papal legate Arno Amalric uh, commanded an army that sacked the town on July 22nd, 1209. Amalric wrote, Our men spared no one, irrespective of rank, sex, or age, and put to the sword almost 20,000 people. After this great slaughter, the whole city was despoiled and burnt, as divine vengeance miraculously raged against it. About 20 years later, Caesarius of Heisterbach wrote that Amalric permitted the death of innocent Christians and Cathars, saying, kill them all, for the Lord knows them that are his, which is a misapplication of 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. Although this may not have been Amalric's initial intent, it certainly was the result. From this we have the popular phrase, kill them all, and let God sort them out. Modern Christians know better. We are heirs of the Reformation and see how the freedoms of speech, the press, separation of church and state, and other freedoms can be a true blessing to both church and society. We do not solve problems with persecution. We engage in open debate and let the word of God persuade people. For example, some modern scholars view Gnosticism as a branch of Christianity and the Gospel of Thomas to be like the source text for Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Diane Pagels and others promoted Gnostic texts from Nag Hammadi as a more authentic feminist Christianity, even though the Gospel of Thomas says that Jesus will guide women to make them male, verse 114. We point out how no credible reading of scripture can get us to that point. We thus prove that Gnosticism is not Christian. When religion becomes political, history shows that people die. This is true for Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and others. Jesus does not align with a political religion, Luke 20, verses 22 to 26. The parable of the weeds illustrates a doctrine that Paul makes plain in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Again, we have 1 Corinthians 5, verses 11 to 13. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. These verses give light to Matthew 7, verses 1 to 2. Judge not that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. All we can do is tell people what the Bible says. If non-Christian people do not want to hear that, well, that's on them. Have a nice day. But if people in the church reject biblical truth, we repeatedly seek to win them back before excommunicating them. Jesus clearly states in Matthew 7, verses 1 to 6, 
that we are blind to our own great sin, regardless of how attentive we may be to the sins of others. Thus, if Christ started weeding, we might be thrown into the fire. Jesus Christ does not condone killing them all and sorting them out because he died to save them all. Right is still right and wrong is still wrong. If, like the Michigan House of Representatives, lawmakers try to make it a felony to refer to uh, the wrong pronouns and that sort of thing for men and women, we know how God created them. And we obey God rather than men. Still, even then, we do not become aggressive. We leave it to the Lord. Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. I once saw a Christian professor talking down to a Hindu follower of Krishna. The conversation died before the gospel could make its appearance. That was not truly a religious discussion, but one born out of cultural, ethnic, and economic power. If we are to go and make disciples of all nations, we must be attentive to our own sin and our own bias. Bottom line, our Lord has been more than merciful, more than loving to us redeemed sinners. We live in light of the Sermon on the Mount, especially Matthew 7, verse 12. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. We would not want to be cast into the lake of fire, therefore, as we have been loved and redeemed by Christ, this springs up also in us as living water of the gospel that sees opportunities to serve others, tell them about Jesus' love for them, and lead them to the truth, that they too may be gathered in with the wheat at the final harvest. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the one true faith in Christ Jesus, even unto everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all according to their needs. We especially remember those who are in need of divine healing, for those who have uh, undergone uh, various procedures or have uh, met various accidents and are recovering and may need your healing as they continue to recover and, and grow back strength, we pray, as well as those who are in rehab facilities trying to recover their, their health and their strength, those who are wrestling with poor health, those who are dealing with cancer, those who are struggling with chronic pain, those who are dealing with dementia, and those who may need various healing of, of either mind or body and uh, who have undergone some uh, traumatic incidents and are trying to make recovery and who are otherwise struggling in some fashion. Lord, we ask that if it be your will, you send your Holy Spirit. Give them the strength of body and of heart and mind to recover to fullness of health and vigor. And Lord, in any case, should it not be that they retain all of their uh, uh, physical or, or other health, Lord, at least be with them. Be their comfort, their guide, their companion. Let them be uh, buoyed up by your presence and be given hope and courage throughout their lives. Lord, in your mercy. We ask that you be with all who are in need of your divine guidance and protection, uh, especially for those whose lives have become complicated and who need to find guidance in difficult situations. Uh, and we ask, Lord, that uh, as you are with those making uh, care decisions and making life choices, uh, also be with those who serve in our military, who are serving us as first responders and as medical caregivers. Be with those who are in authority that they might make the right decisions that are according to your good and gracious will and not according to the wiles of Satan. Be with those who are traveling at this time of year uh, as they might be coming and going either back to college or uh, 
to work or, or some other uh, life opportunity as well as vacation. And we ask you especially, Lord, to be with our national synod uh, as the Missouri Synod gathers in convention at the end of this week and uh, over into the next, that you give the delegates uh, a good knowledge of the material that they have to consider and give them the, uh, the faith and the knowledge to apply scripture to those issues and uh, bring forth a decision that is in accord with your good and gracious will to the benefit of your church. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. For these and other prayer requests, Lord, we set them before your throne of grace, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. At this time, we will collect the offering. We now sing together the offertory, We Give Thee But Thine Own. <coughs> Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the rise of the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he gave him thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen. Amen. Peace. 